This podcast is brought to you by Villanova University on iTunes U. Please visit us on itunes.villanova.edu. Thanks, uh, well, thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks to Villanova for having me, and thanks to all of you. I think one of the great things about doing these, they, they feel like reunions to me. Uh, it's just a great chance to get together with uh, people that I've known in various capacities over the years. And one of the, the last dedication in the book is to people who fight the good fight on behalf of the working class. And so I count you know, everybody in this room as part of that dedication. So it's, uh, it's just a, a pleasure to have a chance to talk a little bit about this work that uh, took me about 12 years to do. Uh, those day jobs are killers. Also, I would say, don't ever do a dual biography. It just takes too damn long. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, I just had to kind of work my way into having both of these folks uh, in this thing. Hey, Eli. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the family contingent has arrived. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm going to start off with a couple uh, short vignettes that I think provide a window onto the story that I want to tell you. So this first one, um, this is Life Magazine from uh, December 12th of 1955. Uh, and I hope there are no archivists in the room because I've handled this so badly. Uh, it, you know, this would be anathema, but this is the issue. And so this is at the, right at the, uh, when the AFL and the CIO merged. And there's a lot of stuff in here about, really the theme of this is kind of uh, labor leaders is what C. Wright Mills, the famed sociologist, called the new men of power. And so you have all these pictures of powerful labor leaders in here. One of the ones that I thought was most interesting, this is a picture of Dave Beck, who was the president of the Teamsters Union at that time. And they show him in his uh, Washington, uh, in fact, I could, I, well, I'll pass this around in a second, uh, in his Washington office, which, which they called the Marble Palace or Marble Temple, and he could press a button and the curtain would go back and you could see the U.S. Capitol in the background. But what interested me more about this was less about Beck and these other potentates, but actually a few pages later, there's a little piece here, and it says, new kinds of unionists, new kind of unionists for labor's new uh, role. So they have a picture here of a guy named Earl Brown who was a shop steward for Butler Brothers, a warehouse firm in St. Louis, Missouri. And it says here, by day, Earl Brown airs problem with boss. By night, Earl Brown, uh, gosh, troubles I can't, uh, my eyes are so bad now. Earl Brown um, supervises teen dance. And the last one is on Sunday, Brown attends Lutheran service. What this piece, service. Lutheran service, Lutheran. yeah. What this article did not say was that he was a community steward in Teamsters Local 688 in St. Louis. This was the local union where that became the laboratory for a visionary form of social unionism, which I called, they called total person unionism. And my two characters of this uh, story, Harold Gibbons and Ernest Calloway, devised this form of unionism. And I'll talk much more thematically about total person unionism, but essentially, uh, total person unionism looked at workers not only as economic beings, but as social beings. And what Gibbons and Calloway would say is that you worked eight hours a day, but you also spent 16 hours a day living a, in a shop. You spent 16 hours a day as a member of a community. And they wanted to weave these lives together to have what they would call full functional working class citizenship. So those are thematically some of the things I'm going to be talking about with St. Louis as their laboratory. Um, and yeah, I can pass that, that around if you uh, folks want to take a look at this. Um, the other thing I want to mention just as a window onto, my, uh, onto these characters is in September of 1968, Harold Gibbons, who was a veteran labor leader of Local 688 in St. Louis of the Teamsters Union, got up and gave a speech at a rally protesting police brutality. There were a group of uh, African-American militants who were known as the Black Liberators who had alleged that they had been beaten in a St. Louis police station. I imagine the relevance of this will become uh, readily apparent to you. Uh, and at this rally, Gibbons said, I am here because I believe we face the very real and serious threat of a developing police state in America. And he says that um, the black liberators have an inalienable right to assemble, to speak, to build black political and economic power and defend themselves against police brutality. And he concluded, and this is the actual notes from his speech, one of the reasons I love this history stuff is you could actually hold these documents. Uh, I place myself and the entire resources of my local union into that fight. Um, 
That took political courage to do. There weren't many labor leaders in St. Louis or elsewhere who were going to speak uh, on behalf of uh, radical black activists uh, who had police encounters. But this was not anything new for Harold Gibbons or certainly Ernest Calloway. And for them, the quest for racial justice uh, was one of the moral barometers, really, in their view, of the legitimacy and credibility of the union movement. And uh, so this is another example of the type of men they were and the types of things they stood for and some of the things that attracted me to their story. Um, so what I want to do is uh, tell you about their story. First, let me say a couple things. Uh, Local 688, which was where there, there was the laboratory for this uh, total person unionism, was based in St. Louis, uh, largely represented warehousing and distribution workers, and most of them before the union were low-wage workers. Uh, this union ranged, it was the largest local union in Missouri for quite some period of time and ranged from 10 to 12,000 members. Um, about 15 to 25 percent of their members over the 20 years where they worked there were African American and about a third of them were women. This was also a union that uh, was viewed as a model of progressive non-communist unionism and the State Department actually sent people from foreign countries when they came to the U.S. in the 50s and 60s to Local 688 to see what uh, progressive uh, liberal unionism could, could be. Um, they were also the subject of a book by a sociologist, Arnold Rose, in uh, 1952 called Union Solidarity, wrote a whole book about their union. So pretty uh, formidable organization. And just a couple of other backdrop things uh, in terms of this work. The Teamsters arguably are one of the most influential post-World War II unions, but they haven't really been studied that much except mostly in sensationalistic terms, which I'm sure we're all familiar. So let me just issue the disclaimer. I've worked on the Teamsters. I have no new insights into Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance. <laughs> uh, people usually expect something like that, but I got, I don't, I got nothing. Uh, although Harold Gibbons was actually Jimmy Hoffa's uh, right-hand man for a period of time, and I will spend a little bit of time talking about that, but mostly I want to talk about the St. Louis experience. Uh, St. Louis is an understudied city. Uh, it's a very interesting as a border city, a crossroads city, but it really hasn't been studied that extensively, and it's got some pretty interesting labor and urban politics. And again, I think this book is a window on to uh, the quest for racial justice, certainly, and the labor's role in that and then also uh, urban politics in the 1960s, uh, 50s and 60s. And I think it's a story that is certainly not only relevant for their time, but I will spend a little bit of time at the end. I think it's extraordinarily relevant for our own. So I will spend a little bit of time talking about the implications of this and certainly want to leave time for questions and comments from you all. Um, so what I want to do fairly quickly is to get these guys to St. Louis. Uh, they run on parallel paths for about 30 years before they get together in St. Louis in 1950. And then I'm going to focus on two programs, their community stewards program in the 1950s and what they called a trade union oriented war on the slums in the 1960s. Uh, that'll be the bulk of what I'll be discussing, which is most pertinent to the theme, uh, themes of the book. So uh, Callaway and Gibbons, uh, Ernest Callaway, Harold Gibbons. Harold Gibbons is white Irish Catholic. Ernest Callaway is African American. They grow up in an early 20th century America that is pretty rigidly segregated, but they actually have an enormous amount in common. Uh, they're born a year apart. Callaway's born in 1909, Gibbons is born in 1910. They're both coal miners' sons, which is very significant. Gibbons from Pennsylvania, Callaway from Kentucky. And I think out of that experience, they were exposed to the United Mine Workers of America, they were exposed to interracial unionism and they had a very highly developed sense of class consciousness. As Calloway would put it, we grew up under what we call you know, corporate feudalism. So this sense of us and them was very strong in their minds. And I think this notion about uh, unaccountable private power was something that drove them throughout their, their lives. They were bright, ambitious young men, but actually never got beyond high school. Uh, they actually got their education through venerable workers education institutions. Uh, the Wisconsin School for Workers in Gibbons' case, and in Callaway, he went to uh, a famous labor college uh, north of New York City, Brookwood Labor College. So they both got their education, important parts of their education from those places. Um, they were both socialists, uh, not communists. They had some bruising encounters with the Communist Party, and they weren't convinced of the Communist Party's commitment to democratic principles. 
but they were socialist, and I would say that even after they dropped their membership in the party officially, they continued to think in what I would call a socialist idiom. And by that, I mean this sense that they were very much concerned about private power, unaccountable power, and they wanted very much to subject that to popular oversight, and you see that throughout their careers. Chicago is the place where they actually first meet briefly in the 1930s and where they really cut their teeth politically. So Gibbons becomes active in uh, the Works Progress Administration as an adult education teacher. And uh, Calloway gets involved with the Red Caps Union, you know, most, a union that represented African American men who were porters in uh, railroad stations. And what's interesting to me is that they're both heavily involved in the CIO, industrial union organizing, and they rise to positions of leadership, and they're extraordinarily young. Gibbons is just 26 years old, and he becomes a national vice president of the AFT. Yeah, uh, Callaway is south of 30, and he's the education director for the Red Caps Union, and he edits its paper, which has the wonderful name Bags and Baggage. Uh, <laughs> And he goes on to be a very prominent labor, uh, labor journalist. I mean, these are guys, um, you know, uh, self-taught, but I mean, Callaway alone, I'd love to do an edited volume of his writing, just a prolific, brilliant writer. So they both are in Chicago during this period, and then Gibbons goes on to, um, for, to work for the uh, Textile Workers Organizing Committee with the CIO in the South and Upper Midwest. And he gets to St. Louis in 1941 to become head of the retail wholesale drugstore union there. Um, Callaway works for the Red Caps. Uh, and well, let me finish Gibbons first up to about 1950 and then Callaway. So Gibbons takes over a bunch of locals that are kind of squabbling and don't get along of these low wage warehouse workers and quickly proves his mettle. He unites them. He's a very aggressive organizer. He loves to strike for first contracts. Uh, you know, he's, he's just a really aggressive guy. Uh, very much in, in, in employers' faces and really builds a very strong union. Um, but in a very controversial move, his union goes independent late in the 1940s and he merges his CIO union with the American Federation of Labor's Teamsters Union in 1949. And a lot of people just couldn't understand why he would go from the CIO to the Teamsters, which did not have a particularly sterling reputation even then. And there are a lot of complicated reasons why that merger occurred, and I'm glad to get into all of those. But one of the main ones was that Gibbons said they're the most powerful union in America. And he really wanted to use that power both for organizing and for broader social purposes. So he merges his union with the Teamsters in 49. Callaway um, does something actually very uh, brave uh, and audacious early in, 19, in 1941. He refuses to register for the draft going into World War II. And for reasons that are still not explicable to me, and I've read his FBI file and a bunch of other stuff, I don't know how he eluded going to jail, but he was classified 4F. He said, I'm not going to fight in a Jim Crow army for rights abroad that I don't have at home. So then he goes on and writes for the CIO News, and then he finds his way to uh, Ruskin College. It's uh, he on a, a British Trade Union Congress scholarship to study in England. So let me just show you, I actually have a few pictures here that I can show you just so you get a look at these, at my char these characters. Uh, let me go back one. Uh, this is Harold Gibbons in 1941 uh, when he first comes to St. Louis. If you go the fourth from the right, he's kind of the a guy with the necktie standing up you know, on, on the back row of the right. And as I was saying to some folks earlier, this is a pretty monochromatic picture. What's that? They look young. They look young. Yeah, yeah, these are young guys. And, uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, again, the, it was a much more diverse local than this picture suggests. But that gives you a picture of Gibbons. And I don't know if you can quite see it. It says SWOCCIO, Steelworkers Organizing Committee, above them, and solidarity on the door to the left. I just love the kind of little things you get in the background of these, of these shots. Uh, this is a picture of Ernest Calloway uh, in England when he's studying at Ruskin College. He's on the, on the right there. And he said that, uh, you know, um, I stood out there because of my brightly colored Argyle socks, the staid, stuffy British always commented on those. Uh, and he had, a, by all accounts, a wonderful time there. Another interesting thing happens to Calloway during this period also. Um, he is, his first wife uh, writes for the Chicago Defender, actually under a pen name, a famed African-American newspaper, and so does he. But she dies, uh, and, in, and um, he marries a couple of years later a woman named Deverne Lee, uh, Deverne Calloway, and uh, Deverne Calloway becomes his political and uh, personal partner. 
and he manages her campaign to become the first African-American woman elected to the Missouri legislature in 1962. And I'll show you a very cool picture of them in a few minutes, but that gives you, uh, that's, uh, gives you a little sense of Gibbons and Calloway at this point in their lives. So um, the other thing I just want to mention, too, is that Gibbons um, in, uh, is very much interested in Calloway as well. They finally get together in St. Louis in 1950. And as the story goes, they had briefly met in Chicago uh, in the 30s. In 1950, they meet in a Chicago bar. Of course, the place where all great decisions are made, right? And uh, Gibbons, as the story goes, says to Calloway, look, it, come down to St. Louis I, for three months, help me set up a research department for Local 688. And Calloway comes in the three months, turn into 25 years, and this incredible uh, personal and political partnership. So, I'm gonna, before I talk about the community stewards program in the 50s, I want to just say a couple of words about their approach to unionism. So one of the things they really wanted to do was to build what they call the wall of security for their members. So you've got to remember that they were representing low-wage warehouse workers, and these were folks coming out of the Great Depression, and they had been devastated. So they really wanted to create a lot of security for people, and with that security, personally, then they could actually go out and do work in the community politically and civically. So they created in 1945 a Labor Health Institute where workers get, what a concept, fully funded uh, health care for themselves and basically fully funded health care for their families, funded entirely by employers. And the other thing was that the union basically runs this program. You know, they have management folks in, but Gibbons is very much in Callaway about what the working class could do. And I have a really interesting quote about their perspective on that in a second. The other thing was they ran a, uh, they developed a, uh, what they called a health and medical camp in a town about 30 miles outside of St. Louis. They built that in 1960. And I interviewed somebody that knew Harold Gibbons from this period. He said that Gibbons once said to me, you know, that whatever the boss gets, the working class should get. If they're going to have country clubs and that type of recreation and leisure, why shouldn't working people get this? So, uh, and part of this was, as they said, that uh, leisure and recreation enhances the ability to think through social problems as a worker and as a citizen. So they wanted that leisure, that recreation, that time away from the city where people could relax, but they really wanted that, again, to be used ultimately for social purposes. The other major thing that they did in this regard in terms of the wall of security is they built these two big senior citizens housing complexes in St. Louis in the early 1960s called Council Plaza. And they built it in a neighborhood of St. Louis called Mill Creek Valley, which had been devastated. We, you know, well, the old line about urban renewal really means, in a, as they called it back then, Negro removal, where a lot of African Americans were moved out of this neighborhood. The promises of housing never materialized. This neighborhood was devastated. In fact, residents even cynically called it Hiroshima Flats because there was just nothing there. And Gibbons and Cal, they built this, this senior citizens' housing there. So they really were people that, again, wanted to build these walls of security, but not so workers could hide behind them and not care about the rest of the world or to create private welfare states. What they really wanted to do was have workers exercising citizenship in their community. Um, and I think it's interesting, too. I just, uh, excuse me one second. I'm just getting over this cold here, so my, uh, get a little raspy. It's important to keep in mind just uh, Gibbons really terrified the power elite in St. Louis. Uh, and there's this great line where Jimmy Hoffa and comes together with Gibbons in the early 50s, actually ir somewhat ironically. They're mob elements that try to move in on Gibbons' locals. And Gibbons looks to the police for help in St. Louis. Well, they don't help him. So he ultimately turns to Hoffa, who gives him some help in terms of the Detroit mob telling the St. Louis mob, keep, it, keep your hands off him. <laughs> And I can talk a lot more about all of that, too. Uh, I just Let me just say this in terms of the mob stuff. I mean, Gibbons certainly turned the other cheek on a lot of corrupt behavior. There's no question about that. But I've read his FBI files. They're voluminous. And the worst thing that they really can pin on him is, as one of these files put it, what they, Bobby Kennedy, you know, when the corruption hearings go on, that they most disliked about Gibbons was they said that he loved to indulge in wine, women, and song and do it on the union expense account. <laughs> so that was about, I mean, the types of stuff that Jimmy Hoffa did, bribes, kickbacks, loans, pension fund chicanery, Gibbons was not about that, sweetheart contracts, none of that stuff. Um, but Hoffa once said to Gibbons, you know, after they'd been in a bargaining session, he goes, you know, 
He says, Gibbons, he called him Gibbons. He says, Gibbons, you know, there are fellows back in Detroit that don't like me. But these people in St. Louis actually hate you. Uh, and what it was, I think they just didn't know. I mean, Hoffa, they got him, money and power. OK, we don't like it, but we understand it. But Gibbons, he wants this power for what? I mean, there's all this social engineering that looks awfully like socialism. And they just weren't sure where he was going to stop, and they had the power to do stuff. So with that, let me just talk a little bit about their, these two community action programs they had in the 50s and 60s. So in the 1950s, um, right after Taft-Hartley is passed, and I think it's, you know, that's the act that gives us right to work, but just as importantly, things that workers used to do collectively you know, to further their interests, like sympathy strikes and secondary boycotts, those are taken away. And that's how the Teamsters did a lot of their organizing. So they realized, as Callaway said, we're in a different ball game. We don't have the apron strings of government, as Callaway put it, from the New Deal days. We're going to have to play politically. We're going to have to be much more active on the community side. Not that they stopped striking or they were any less militant. They negotiated amazing contracts, five-year contracts with all kinds of great stuff. But they wanted to play in the community. So what they said was, you know, look, workers are citizens. And our workers, you know, and, and, and this is the thing. They, they actually, you know, um, Gibbons once said, and I just should read this too, because this gives you a sense of the flavor of what they were doing. He once talked about the work they had done. He said, this was a job of building that was not done by, pardon Karen, college professors, uh, and to me, smart lawyers or high-salaried executives, but by little people, common, ordinary people, the men and women of the shops. And he goes on to say, I emphasize this because we of the working class tend to have an inferiority complex and we don't do the things that need to be done. So this was all about proving that workers could be just as good as their bosses in every respect, and that meant being citizens in the community as well. So what they do is they look at St. Louis and they say, we're going to take the idea of being a shop steward from the plant and put that in the community. So they treated the city of St. Louis like it was an employer. So St. Louis was a ward city. So they said, in every ward, we're going to have community stewards who will solicit grievances in terms of things that are going on in people's neighborhoods. So they solicit grievances, you know, uh, you know the street light doesn't work, the uh, garbage isn't getting picked up, there's an eyesore in the neighborhood. They did those sorts of things. And they would then go to the city, they called them aldermen, their city councilors or heads of departments or whatever, and they'd get those fixed. But they really had much bigger fish to fry, and this is where it really gets interesting, because they really were trying to make structural change. So among the first things that they went after were transportation and actually the, uh, setting up a, um, a, a consolidated sewer district. So they found out in surveying their members, and they would have annual meetings and ask their members what's going on, that their transportation cost that was privately run was too, you know, was too high and the quality was poor. They found out with the sewer system, they had all these different entities overseeing the sewer system in St. Louis. I don't know if you know St. Louis, it gets lots of rain and flooding, and they had all these public health problems and a huge encephalitis outbreak, I believe, in the 1920s. So they wanted to have an entity that would really oversee their sewer system. And so they used uh, ballot measures or referenda. They actually collected signatures from members to put these things on the ballot and subject them to popular uh, democracy. So, Here's a picture of their campaign for better bus service in St. Louis. And they're showing you know, the number of city signatures and county signatures. And this guy on the left is interesting. Robert Pentland was a J.C. Penney's warehouse worker who was their political action director. And they ran him as an insurgent candidate for the Missouri legislature in 1948 against enormous odds. And he was elected. Uh, and one of the first things he did once he got into the legislature was to fight for a Fair Employment Practices Act for African Americans. And he came from a largely white working class neighborhood in St. Louis. So these were people that really did walk the walk in important ways. Oh, oops, ah. uh, so they lose the transportation uh, one narrowly, but they win on the sewer system. And I was just in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago. I mean, they still to this day have a metropolitan uh, sewer authority. That, uh, you know, that really oversees this system. So they were starting to make a real imprint on their city in terms of major quality of life and structural issues. Um, they did a bunch of other interesting things, too. Um, they uh, had a program, if you may, some of you are, few of you, a few of you here are, well, are old enough to recall the 1950s. Uh, there was a lot of concern, some of it overblown, about juvenile delinquency, right? 
So they actually founded programs, they did research and they founded programs. They had something that they called the Teamsters Teen Town, where they actually ran dances for teenagers uh, so they'd have a safe environment in which to operate. The thing I really loved about that too was they were going, they, they wanted to create a drag strip where people could drag race safely. Of course, they're taking all the fun out of it, but, uh, but, uh, but you know, that's the type of stuff they did. They did a report that went to a St. Louis grand jury about how to improve conditions for young people. And these were community stewards doing a lot of this work themselves, supported by union staff. They fought for a free city college so that the sons and daughters of the working class would have the same opportunity to go to school as uh, other folks. And Earl Brown, the steward in the uh, Life magazine that, a that Alice has here, he was the guy that proposed that program eventually came to fruition. But the campaign that really put them on the map in the 1950s, I think, and tells you a lot about the Community Stewards Program, was a fight uh, over a rat control ordinance. And this had enormous public health implications and also racial and class implications. So St. Louis had a lot of dilapidated housing. Many African Americans move into St. Louis in the 30s and 40s and live in that dilapidated housing. And they're white folks as well. And there's an enormous problem with rats. There's open privies and the city isn't taking care of it because the city wants to tear all this stuff down and do urban revitalization. So they're saying if we're going to tear all this stuff down, well, and, I, and I'm reading the letters you know, from the landlords and developers who are telling them in the files, you know, don't do this stuff. We don't want to pay the money for this. So the city council passes an ordinance and behind the scenes, and I was reading the, the, uh, the literature, they're saying we have no intention of obeying this ordinance. <laughs> uh, so there's a young African-American boy named Reginald Harrington, two years old, who in 1955 is severely bitten by rats and almost dies. So the community stewards swing into action and they're like muckraking journalists. You know, they take pictures, they go to city council meetings, they lobby, they rally, they go to court. And eventually they get a court order and then they get the city council to approve a, a stronger ordinance and they get it passed. And this, uh, solidifies completely uh, Local 688 and the African American community in St. Louis. Keep in mind as well that Ernest Calloway, while all this is going on, a year later becomes the president of the St. Louis NAACP. So he's a Teamsters official on the one hand and an NAACP leader on the other hand. So what they called back in the day a Negro Labor Alliance is really beginning to come into shape. And the idea is the UAW's regional director said about the RAT campaign was that People, no matter what area of the city they live in, whether you live in a slum area or an exclusive area, you should still enjoy a certain basic level of security. So this stuff really puts them on the map. And I should also add that they're continually fighting for racial justice. Uh, when Gibbons joins the Teamsters, basically the National Teamsters, he wants to organize taxi drivers who are African American. The National Teamsters say, we don't want them. And Gibbons says, well, I want them and we're gonna organize them. And actually he integrates white and black taxi locals and that actually becomes an issue because of some of the strong arm tactics that were used before the McClellan Committee on Corruption and Bobby Kennedy. But Bobby Kennedy doesn't at all talk about the purpose for which it was used. You know, you never would have known that there was a question of racial justice in all of this. Uh, and they fought within their own contracts to advance African Americans from you know, lower level jobs to higher level jobs. They put together a plan to help desegregate public schools in St. Louis and did a lot of work around housing, which I'll get to in a second because housing stuff becomes very prominent for them in the late 60s. All of this culminates in 1957 when there's an effort by, St. Louis has a group of business and, uh, uh, and uh, political elites. Uh, they actually were formed in the 50s and they have this wonderful name, Civic Progress. And they're still named Civic Progress. And so Civic Progress and the mayor of St. Louis, they want to uh, make the world safe for uh, urban redevelopment. So they look at St. Louis and say the impediment to this is we have a system that's based on political wards. So they want to convert the wards into at-large positions. So you know, you know, heads are nodding, you know what that means. And with growing African-American political power, if you have to run citywide versus an award, it really blunts that. So with Callaway at the NAACP's helm and Gibbons and the community stewards, they band together and they beat this uh, attempt to change the city charter uh, overwhelmingly. And after that, there's all this talk about, well, it's interesting, Business Week writes an article and they say that uh, the elite in St. Louis is going to have to deal with what they called the problem of Gibbons. <laughs> Sounds like it could be a movie, the problem of Gibbons. Uh, and they talk about the need to seek a civil rapprochement 
their term, you know, with Harold Gibbons. And so there's all this talk now, the community stewards are saying, Let's, we're going to create a community bargaining table here. We're going to bargain about stuff in the community, about investment, uh, about tax policy. They start to think about putting their plan out in the suburbs because people in new subdivisions are getting ripped off by developers and complaining. They're going to have a community citywide assembly to go for larger types of policy changes. They're really poised to be a major political power in the city. Now, you, you knew the story was going to have an unhappy ending, uh, and it does, because uh, Gibbons hitches his star to Jimmy Hoffa, and that's when the corruption hearings that some of you may be familiar with in the 1950s occur. And Gibbons has his own problem with a tainted election. He was involved in St. Louis. So a lot of his attention goes to dealing with that. He also helps manage Hoffa's campaign for the Teamsters presidency in 1957. So Gibbons, uh, <coughs> and also the legal fees just continue to mount. <coughs> After <coughs> Hoffa's elected president, Gibbons goes with him to Washington and takes away a lot of the talented leaders that ran this program. And so essentially this program lies dormant by the end of the 1950s after so much initial promise. Excuse me. So the second act of this program occurs in the 1960s. Um, let me see, do I have a, let me show you a couple other things here. Um, yeah, this was something that they were also going to do after the charter campaign. They were into a labor environmental alliance before anybody even knew the term. There are soap factories and other factories in St. Louis that are polluting in neighborhoods. <coughs> and so they're starting to take this on to say that you've got to do something to clean up this environment in St. Louis. This is in 1958. And you see some of these signs here that give you a sense of where they were headed you know, with that. You also get a sense of it being a family type of thing, too, that there are children there. They did a lot of work bringing families into stuff as well. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, this is just a picture. Uh, in the early 1960s, Ernest Calloway and his wife, Deverne, uh, they edited a paper called The New Citizen. Again, this idea of citizenship is very, very important to these folks. And they called it a do-it-yourself uh, paper. You know, you can see how old school it is. They're sitting there on their table cutting and pasting it. And this really helped uh, get their political program out in the community. And you may also be able to, if you can discern, there's a picture of, it says, March to Independence. It's Africa in the background of countries that are becoming newly independent. So Callaway really was very much a globalist and an internationalist in his view, is writing about this stuff, you know, all, all, all the time. So in the early 1960s, um, Gibbons and Callaway run into a little bit of rough sledding. Um, Gibbons goes to Washington, works for Jimmy Hoffa as his top guy, and he hopes to uh, enlarge Jimmy Hoffa's social vision, uh, but he's largely unsuccessful in terms of doing that. Uh, Hoffa does give more money and somewhat more support to civil rights causes, uh, but um, you know, not much more in that regard. And then there's a famous incident in 1963, right after John F. Kennedy is assassinated. Gibbons often ran the Union while Hoffa was away, and he was away frequently. And so Gibbons orders the flag in the headquarters lowered to half staff uh, in respect for the president. Now, he had no love for the Kennedys, but that, he just said, that's what you should do. When Hoffa finds out, he goes ballistic. He orders the flag raised back up to full staff and makes these intemperate remarks about JFK that uh, do not go over well, and so Gibbons is fed up and has had enough. And so he decides to, uh, he remains loyal to Hoffa, you know, the rest of his, 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 his life. He's, he's certainly loyal to Hoffa, but he uh, goes back to St. Louis. It's interesting because Gibbons actually um, was preparing to run for the Teamsters presidency on a number of occasions. And in 1966, he puts together a campaign, an insurgent campaign, because Hoffa's about to go to jail and Gibbons senses his opportunity, and he puts together a campaign to take a lot of these concepts to the National Union. But ultimately, he backs away, I think, because he realized he never quite had the votes within the Union. He never fully escaped Hoffa's shadow. There were people that called him uh, that uh, socialist CIO punk. And I think he probably would agree with the socialist and the CIO part, but, but perhaps not the punk, certainly not the punk. But he never had the support. So uh, Fitz, uh, 
Hoffa appoints this guy, Frank Fitzsimmons, who some of you may know, who was a very pliable person to have that position. And I interviewed Jimmy Hoffa's daughter, who's a judge in St. Louis, and she said to me that my father often said one of the worst mistakes he ever made was not making Harold the president of the union. So Gibbons then is looking for stuff to do in the mid-60s. Callaway's in a somewhat similar position. Um, you know, he's very active in terms of the civil rights movement in St. Louis. He manages the campaigns of a number of African-American firsts, people that are the first elected to various positions. Uh, but he has a nemesis, uh, a generational nemesis named William Clay, who was a longtime congressman from St. Louis, who some of you may know. And Clay was 20 years younger than Callaway. And while Callaway said St. Louis isn't Birmingham or Selma, we can have what he called a planned social revolution here. And incrementally, we can work with uh, white leaders because we have the votes. We're a budding political power. We can negotiate a civic partnership with them. Clay and his younger allies would have none of this. They said, we're going to go for broke. Uh, we got to get freedom, and we got to get it now. And I think Clay actually sensed the emotional temperature of the African-American community in St. Louis, perhaps more than Callaway did. So by the mid-60s, Callaway is more marginalized within St. Louis black freedom struggle politics. So by the mid-60s, they're both angling to get back in because there's all these insurgencies going on in the mid-1960s, and they're saying the union's on the sidelines. We should be in the center of this. We really got to be out there. So they come up with what Callaway conceives of as a trade union-oriented war on the slums. And this is around the war on poverty, which you may recall from the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. And Callaway is at first a supporter of the war on poverty, but ultimately becomes a critic because he thinks that it's basically too much ar around individual uh, change. You know, that there's all this stuff around how to get yourself ready for job interviews and how to make yourself more presentable and to learn skills. And while he doesn't think it's unimportant, Callaway's a, an unrepentant structuralist. He says you got to deal with structural stuff. You got to deal with jobs. You got to deal with tax policy. You got to deal with land use. You got to deal with bigger things. So. There's a neighborhood in St. Louis where Callaway and about 500 other members of Local 688 live who are African Americans called Tandy, T-A-N-D-Y. Uh, and in the Tandy neighborhood, it's really the name, Tandy, yeah, for, for us Tasty Cakes fans, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the Tandy neighborhood, and they put together this community organizing project, and they get this amazing group of people together, including a former a, a guy who was a minister who had organized peasants in Bolivia in the early 1960s. He becomes the head of this program, and he says, I'm going to give you a dose of Saul Alinsky. And they get uh, workers from the shop. They pull together this dream team of organizers, and they start to make common cause with African-American insurgents in St. Louis. And Again, the idea is let's create a community bargaining table and let's use the power and expertise and skill that we have from the shop floor as unionists. We know about power and pressure. Let's use it in the community. So they align with uh, welfare rights recipients in, Saint, in Missouri. They're, they give terrible, you know, the benefits are really, really low. And the welfare recipient group deputizes the Teamsters to be their lead negotiators. I mean, not that they're giving them the whole store, but you guys know how to bargain a contract. You guys know how to use this power, so they're doing that. They're fighting for lower uh, grocery prices in neighborhoods because more affluent neighborhoods get uh, lower prices than the poorer neighborhoods. They fight to get African-American police and firefighters hired, African-American history taught in the schools. And they get very active around tenants' issues. So one of the things that happens in St. Louis that's really interesting for a very brief period in the 19, late 60s, there's a shotgun marriage between the auto workers union and uh, the Teamsters called the Alliance for Labor Action. And it's a complicated story as to why Frank Fitzsimmons uh, would want to have an alliance with Walter Ruther, <laughs> you know, the head of the UAW, but they both had their reasons. And St. Louis was one of the places where the Teamsters and UAW actually came together and worked because the auto workers looked at Gibbons. He's not like all these other Teamsters. I mean, he's one of us. And so they're fighting around uh, tenants' rights, and they're saying that you know, we should get uh, what they call a Wagner Act for tenants, you know, similar to national labor relations law for workers. We should have laws like that for tenants. And if we can fight the boss on the job, you know, we can fight the landlord in the community. So they're having real successes with all of these things, and they're really getting these alignments going on. And the, there's a culmination, just as there was with the charter change, the culmination in St. Louis in the 1960s is a, the, is a National Public Housing Tenants Rent Strike. Um, does, the, does the term Pruitt-Igoe mean anything, anybody? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Um, 
Pruitt Igo became the poster child for a failed public housing policy in the United States. It was this enormous high rise public housing project in St. Louis that was imploded in 1972, and to this day, nothing's been built there. And as you may know, public housing was, you know, at first was racially integrated, but later became racially segregated. More affluent whites left, and African Americans are left behind. It was often shoddily built. Uh, there were no amenities nearby, and it really starts to deteriorate. And so when the St. Louis Public Housing Authority in 1969 says, we're going to raise rents, I mean, many of the people that live in there are very, very poor, they say enough. And inspired by social movements of the 60s, they begin to withhold their rent. And this strike drags on. And the Teamsters, through the community stewards, have good connections to the tenant strike leaders. And the city of St. Louis is flipping out. This is like this long, hot summer thing. St. Louis hasn't had civil unrest like other cities, but they're worried it's going to happen and they don't know what to do. So they turn to, of all people, Harold Gibbons, the great social and political pariah. The mayor of St. Louis says, look, can you help me? And Gibbons says, yeah, I'll help you, but I have a few conditions. You know, I'm a bargainer. I got a few things I want. And so what he says is that what we want to do is we want to create the St. Louis Civic, Civic Alliance for Housing, and we want to run public housing in the city of St. Louis. Uh, we want to involve tenants in running this housing. And we want to have a board that oversees this, and a third of the members are going to be public housing tenants. And Gibbons gets the blessing of the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, a fellow named George Romney, <laughs> whose son you may know. <laughs> but some of you may remember George Romney was governor of Michigan. Uh, he was actually became HUD secretary under Richard Nixon and actually believed in fair housing. <laughs> you know, so Romney says the Teamsters have more expertise in terms of doing this than anybody else in St. Louis. I bless this. And the other blessing they got was from a, Gibbons convenes this meeting. I mean, it's one of these things that you, historically would you have loved to have been there. He gets all the civic progress people, the biggest business folks and the whole elite of St. Louis in a room. And his, his, uh, his basically his bag man becomes a guy named Augie Bush, who's, you know, you've heard Bush beer, Budweiser, Augie Bush is the head of this whole operation. And Augie Bush is a guy who's really rooted in St. Louis neighborhoods. He really cares about the city. So Augie Bush basically comes around to all these people and says, how much are you going to give? How much are you going to give? And they all pony up for the St. Louis Civic Alliance for Housing. And the Teamsters run this for two years. Uh, I mean, just an extraordinary thing. Uh, Ernest Calloway, uh, who had been sort of marginalized politically, he runs for Congress against William Clay as nemesis and loses very badly. He's involved in helping write the social goals for this movement. And he says this was a, a small October revolution, or as he put it, a revolution of people over things. And they're poised, they have a plan they put together to actually raise Pruitt Igo, this huge eyesore of a failed public housing <laughs> complex, and build low rise housing with amenities around it. You know, to really re it revolutionize what public housing could be. But in Romney, in the end, reneges on a deal that he was involved in because Nixon's Southern strategy starts to kick in. And Nixon says, you know, I don't want any part of this anymore. And a congresswoman from South St. Louis who has control over HUD's budget also is opposed to it. So the deal falls through. And so they never get to follow through completely on their plans in the Civic Alliance. Once the immediate crisis passes, you know, it also folds as well. Um, the other thing is that uh, there starts to be some backlash against the union as well. And I'll, let me just briefly go through that, and then I wanted to say a few concluding remarks and have some time to talk. But, and I'll talk more, I'd be glad to talk more about this in the questions, but there is certainly some backlash, particularly among the union's white membership around these issues. And so there's meetings where they go out and uh, the leaders of the union go out and talk to the union shop stewards and they find that a lot of white members are saying, you're spending way too much time working on behalf of these African Americans or the United Farm Workers or these other folks, and uh, our conditions on the shop floor are deteriorating. And then there's an attack from the left. There's a group called Rank and File Teamsters, and they basically say, you know, the union was kind of bifurcated. Gibbons had the community stewards program, and then they had traditional business agents. And those folks, they were saying, uh, you know, sit on their butts, they, you know, in their mohair carpeted offices and air-conditioned LTDs, and they're not doing anything for us. And particularly United Parcel Service conditions really had deteriorated. So they're getting it from both sides. 
Uh, Gibbons, not to his credit, I mean, he ruthlessly beats down this insurgency. You know, no question about that. He wasn't going to cotton to that. But one of the things he does that's kind of interesting, there are white members of the union that say that we want a Tandy area project in our neighborhood. And they start one actually in South St. Louis. And they start to deal with community issues there. And they start to deal with issues in the suburbs as well. Uh, because in the suburbs, they fight, for example, a jack-in-the-box is coming into a neighborhood and would have uh, really destroyed the character of the neighborhood. They fight to zone it out and succeed, and they get involved in suburban activity. So they do have some other things going on that are pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing that they start to do as well, and there might have been possibly a third act for the Community Stewards Program, they start to take women's issues very seriously, which they had not done before. So they start to talk about child care and abortion rights, and they start to say, we need to negotiate for this in our contracts, and we need to put it more at the front and center of what we do as a union. So there was potentially some interesting stuff that might have happened in terms of a third act for this program, but that was not to be. So let me wind the story up. Um, Callaway retires and actually goes to uh, teach at St. Louis University. And then when I was in St. Louis two weeks ago, I actually met some of his former students. Uh, who just testified what a captivating teacher he was. I actually have a syllabus for one of his courses here, and it's amazing, his course on the urban crisis. It's, it's so prophetic. I mean, here's a guy that in 1976 was still writing and is saying we need global unions because these multinational corporations are sweeping the board with us. This is in 76 he was saying this stuff. Um, anyway, so Callaway's at St. Louis University. Gibbons becomes an ardent foe of the Vietnam War. Uh, both he and Callaway, while they were anti-communist, never lost, I think, their socialist distrust for, for you know, capitalist foreign policy and what they might call capitalist wars. And so Gibbons speaks at the first Vietnam War moratorium, the first meeting of uh, labor for peace, of anti-war unions he convenes in St. Louis in 1972. He goes to Vietnam and meets with prisoners of war and tries to actually bring them home unsuccessfully. At the same time, He's actually friendly with Henry Kissinger, who he knows from having le taught at lectured at Harvard. And he's carrying on conversations with Henry Kissinger at the same time that he's doing this real badass anti-war stuff. Well, Frank Fitzsimmons, who is the head of the union and now has decided he likes warming the seat and actually wants to hold it in his own right, he's working to broker an endorsement of Richard Nixon in 1972, you know, that the Teamsters would endorse Richard Nixon. There's only one person on the Teamsters executive board in 1972 who votes against the Nixon endorsement. Harold Gibbons. And uh, there's actually a great picture here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I should just add, uh, no, just, I'll, give, I'll come back to that in a second. That's a parenthetic <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, actually, they were doing environmental stuff during the Tandy area project as well. And you can see the, uh, Saint, the uh, arch in, in the background, Gateway Arch. Um, this picture here, um, well, you know this guy here made many of you in the light colored jacket there, Richard Nixon, and there's Harold Gibbons lining up a golf shot. Uh, but for all of Nixon's blandishments, uh, Gibbons resisted them. So Fitzsimmons um, decides he wants to get rid of Gibbons and stages a palace coup and is able to oust him early in uh, 1970. And uh, I mean, actually, 1973, he's able to, to oust him. And so that's pretty much the end of this, uh, these experiments in uh, total person unionism, community bargaining table, working class citizenship. Gibbons uh, lives, uh, dies in early 1982. Uh, and interestingly and poignantly, uh, he had wanted Ernest Calloway to deliver his eulogy. And in his usual non-presumptuous manner, he even gave him a title for the eulogy, which was Gibbons, Concerned Citizen. <laughs> so again, you see the citizen thing. It really meant so much to these folks to be taken seriously as citizens. But uh, tragically, Calloway could not deliver the eulogy. He suffered a stroke that debilitated him, left him unable to speak. So he was unable to, yeah, that, there's the tearjerker part, unable to eulogize his friend. Callaway lives till, uh, dies in uh, 1990. Um, so let me just say a couple of things quickly about implications of this, and then I really would love to, you know, pick up some, you know, pick up, have, have some conversation about this. I mean, if we think about today, I'd say a couple of things are in terms of relevance. One is that I think that Gibbons and Callaway, as far back as the 60s, they were saying we've reached what Callaway called a stagnant plateau in terms of organizing. You know, in 
especially, they didn't quite foresee the growth in the public sector, but certainly in terms of the private sector, they knew things were not going well. And they were really advocating organizing the unemployed. And I think that they would endorse efforts today to, to build a broad working class movement, the things that are going on with car wash workers and day laborers, immigrants, restaurant workers, domestics. They would say we need to do much more of that. And unions who are strong or who have resources should be aiding these types of insurgencies just as they did. I think they would see some fertile ground for total person unionism uh, in several ways. Um, you know, if you think about affordable housing, I don't know how big a problem that is here in Philadelphia. I've been away for 14 years. But I know uh, in Oregon, where I live, and a lot of other parts of the country, I think affordable housing has become such a crisis for folks. And I think it's something that begs for a total person unionism approach and for unions to be involved in addressing it. I also think the issues around work-family balance are also are critical in this regard. All the moves around paid leave and scheduling and childcare, I think there's real fertile ground. Again, it would have to be adapted, but for some of these community steward total person concepts to be used today. A uh, couple other things, I think in terms of politics, I, well, this is me, argue, this is my argument. I think our politics has become a little too much inside baseball over recent years, and we tend to be electoral. That's where most of our political work goes. I think they would say, as they did, that politics is much bigger than that. It's about citizenship. It's about civic participation. It's about a lot of other things, trying to get at structural issues that affect the quality of life in a community. And so politics, electoral politics, is important. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient, that they would urge us to a more expansive view of politics. I think the fight for racial justice and being forthright in that regard is absolutely critical. I mean, certainly in terms of the issues raised by Black Lives Matter, I think they would have applauded that Richard Trumka, the head of the AFL-CIO, went to Ferguson, went to St. Louis, you know, uh, about a year ago, uh, and spoke forthrightly about racial justice, mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex. But they would probably have say they might have also have said, "Why did it take you so long? You know, and why aren't more people doing this?" They had a type of political courage. They had a type of political courage, I think, that is all too rare, and it's something that we should also pay attention to. So finally, let me just close with this last uh, paragraph in the book in terms of legacy. Uh, in 1955, there was a, a person wrote into the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and was complaining about the community stewards and said, you know, why are they acting as an intermediary between workers and uh, between citizens and government? It's not necessary. And Harold Gibbons said, <coughs> The working man, the average citizen, is apt to be bewildered by the many pressure groups, apt to feel helpless, and ultimately to become complacent or cynical about his own role in a democracy. Far from being an inter intermediary, Gibbons asserted, the union's role is to encourage our working members to use their rights as citizens in a democracy. And I think his, uh, this observation assumes special meaning in light of Callaway's prophetic prediction that new economic concentrations of power seriously undermine social and democratic institutions by establishing the supremacy of private decision making. So in this context, their abiding faith that ordinary people could use their experiences as workers to enhance their roles as citizens offers hope, in Callaway's words, not only for extending democratic unionism, but for reviving democracy itself. Thanks. So I'd love to, you know, get comments or questions about, you know, anything here. Yeah. The oh yeah, you want to see? Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, let's go to the pictures. Uh, let's see. So this is um, this is in Selma, Alabama, in 1965. Uh, there was a woman named Viola Liuzzo who was the uh, wife of a Teamsters business agent who was ferrying civil rights demonstrators and was killed, I think, by a, a Klansman, a Ku Klux Klansman. And this is Jimmy Hoffa, Harold Gibbons, Martin Luther King. I'm not sure who the uh, person is to uh, King's left at her funeral. I think this is Joseph Conaway. Con uh, I forget how you say his name, another Teamster official with the glasses on the right. Uh, I had to put this one in. Uh, and you might go, well, you know, what's this about? Well, you probably recognize maybe some of the younger folks. I don't know. Do you know any of these people? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. This is a group that was known as the Rat Pack. Uh, there were these Hollywood entertainers, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and uh, Johnny Carson. And Gibbons loved the nightlife. He loved Vegas. I mean, you know, Teamsters had stuff there. But he really liked 
I think the thing he liked about these guys was that they were kind of outlaws in a way, and Gibbons too had this sense, you know, that uh, they were very cynical about law, cynical about authority, and Sinatra had that kind of in-your-face, you know, F-U type of approach, and I think he was very much attracted to that. But this is at a charity show, so Gibbons raised tons of money for charity, but instead of farming the administration of this out to um, outside groups, again, to show what the working class could do, he ran his own charity shows and delighted in doing that and raises, raises bunches of money. So uh, again, I just, you know, you just don't see the cigarette and drink anymore, you know, it's, uh, I'm, and in any case, yeah, it's just one I had to, had to have that one okay, in there. Still smoke some drinks, but <laughs> you spend time with Lady Gaga, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Now, that's what we Yeah, these, yeah, that's right. Well, uh, let's see. That's right, they're all, yeah, they're all dead. Yeah, they're all dead. I, I, I hate to break it to you, <laughs> but they're all dead. <laughs> they're all gone. Uh, let's see, what I, that sh oh, okay, oops. Let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, well, this is just kind of a classic Jimmy and uh, you know, Harold Gibbons picture. And, and again, I just picked this because I just thought the Viceroy pack was so, uh, was just so priceless. But you get a sense of you know they, a very a very close relationship. But part of this was, I think, he really owed Hoffa in the sense of helping. You know, Gibbons feared for his life when the mob came into St. Louis and you know or was in St. Louis and was trying to put people on his payroll. And I think he also they were both coal miner sons. I mean, I think he had a real understanding of coming up in a very very hard scrabble sort of way. So uh, anyway, so yeah. But anyway, uh, I'd love to any you know comments, questions, anything people want to. You know, talk about. Can you color that one? Yeah. Like, look at this cover photo. His eyebrows are so much bushier and parched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. I do not know the answer to that, Peggy. Uh, it could be. It could be. Or maybe, yeah, yeah. He was apparently an impeccable dresser. Uh, you know, and uh, somebody again who just people said that he just had this kind of just amazing energy. I've interviewed one of his sons who said that, you know, he was just the kind of guy he could get by on four hours of sleep, get up the next day, do it all over again. And, uh, you know, was known as being a, uh, you know, a fantastic negotiator, shrewd organizer. Um, the one thing, though, was that because of the Teamsters were always fighting other unions over jurisdiction, and uh, Gibbons also didn't have a particularly high view of people whose politics didn't match his, so they really functioned a lot on their own. They had some relationships with other unions, but they were certainly limited in both locally and nationally by being a pariah within the union movement, and again, by their own you know, fights with other unions. So it wasn't as broad as it might, it might have been. Yeah, Peter? Where did Gibbons fall in the farm worker scheme? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's good, very interesting you ask that. Um, he was a strong supporter of the United Farm Workers, uh, and actually, you know, really helped the boycott in St. Louis in the late uh, in the in the in the 70s. And then, he, when the Teamsters, you know, were fighting the U the farm workers in California, he's actually asked to go in to try to help negotiate a settlement because he's the one person within the Teamsters that the UFW actually trusted enough that, to meet with. But he's given, a, I tried to find that story and I couldn't really find archival stuff on it. So the most I know is that I think he was given a fairly narrow berth as far as what he was uh, authorized to negotiate and just could not give the UFW enough. In, uh, California. in California. Yeah, and I think that he was, and I'm sure that he was conflicted about it. I, I imagine he was conflicted about it. I mean, I think he had some qualms about Chavez as making the transition from being the leader of a social movement to being a union leader. His daughter told me that he had expressed some concerns about that, which were not totally illegitimate. But I think he was given kind of an impossible task and, you know, couldn't deliver the goods. I think um, they tried to get the UFW uh, to intervene. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was, I mean, that was part of it, which, you know, that, that just wasn't going to happen. And then, yeah, and, and so again, I don't think he had much to give them uh, other than something that was much more beneficial to the Teamsters than it was to the UFW. But he had great respect for Cesar Chavez and strongly supported him through the 60s and into the 70s. Uh, was Hoffa a Republican? Uh, you know, he, 
yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and I know that they were, they were close to yeah. this thing, but the Simmons era, yeah. to the Republican Party and Nixon, but yeah. I just wondered what his particular politics Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Hoffa in many ways was almost anti-political. I mean, it was very much a thing of just throwing money at people and, you know, really just trying to, you know, again, buy as much space for the types of organizing that he wanted to do. Uh, I mean, I think his politics were certainly, you know, for want of a better term, business unionist. Like in the old Samuel Gompers thing, reward your friends and punish your enemies. So they could be Republican, they could be Democrat. But he certainly thought that, like Walter Ruther or Gibbons, I mean, he tolerated Gibbons because he said he's still a teamster. All this other stuff you do, you know, it, it's, it's, you know it's okay as long as, you know, you play within a certain set of boundaries. Uh, so I think that he probably would lean somewhat more Republican. Sure thing, thanks for coming. Lean somewhat more Republican, but uh, really, in fact, Gibbons dragged him kicking and screaming into creating what they called DRIVE. It was, the, uh, it was their version of COPE, you know, the Committee on Political Education. And Hoffa wasn't even that happy with doing that. Gibbons, again, part of trying to enlarge Hoffa's vision was to say that we should really be political, we should mobilize people from the grassroots. But Hoffa actually never gave Gibbons much control in terms of doing that program which was another part of his discontent with him. There was a, there was a movie many years ago uh, called Fit. Yeah, created. yeah, um, yeah, remember it well. And uh, yeah. I thought that the guy, there was a, a character in there who reminded me a little bit of Gibbons, who was like a second in command mm -hmm. to Hoffa. Yeah. Do you remember that character? Yeah, composite yeah, yeah. perhaps, perhaps so, yeah, yeah. Keep yeah. Keep him away yeah. from the mob and the yeah. Parade. Yeah. And having a tough time with it. And yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think, like I say, I think, you know, Gibbons had a bunch of plans when he went to Washington. I mean, they had wanted to get the membership of the union up to two million. They never got there. Uh, I mean, Hoffa really, his big focus was the, you know, his crowning achievement was the master freight agreement in trucking, you know, in 1964, I believe, that, you know, basically if you were a trucker wherever you were in the U.S., your conditions were fairly similar. I mean, that's the thing that, these folks, Gibbons often said, you know, he said, look, it, I'm not happy in a way because all this centralized bargaining really is sort of anti-democratic. But after Taft-Harley said, if we're going to, you know, the only way we can really get these conditions is to have area agreements, regional agreements, master agreements, and there's less of a place for workers in those. And what he said, and, you know, it's kind of a, you could say it was a Faustian bargain. He said the most places where workers can participate is going to be in the community side, not on the shop floor side. And I think it really ended up biting them because when the shop floor conditions deteriorated, you know, it's like that thing, bread and roses are great, and roses are great to talk about, but when the bread ain't there, you know, the roses don't seem to smell as much. So I think that's kind of the problem that they began to ran into, or to run into. I remember that the Teamsters were virulently hostile to the farm workers in Philadelphia. Mm. Station themselves all along the plant. Well, station themselves all along the parkway in order to be able to say that's a teamster who's liable to kill, try to kill oh, Caesar oh my God. and alert the cops. That was well, their plan. Well, uh, well, and that's how virulent it was. And it got to the point where Caesar decided not to come to Philadelphia and cancel the idea of coming to meet with the Pope. Well, well. Well, I'll tell you something, but promise you don't tell anybody else. Uh, actually, one of the first things I did in the labor movement working for the farm workers was to go down to Teamsters headquarters in Washington and pick it. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. You know, I, was, I was, what, 20 years old, you know? Seemed like the right thing to, uh, anyway. <laughs> it just brings, yeah, it was a very funky time in terms of all of those, you know, relationships and things. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah person. Yeah. 
Walter Warren is social, political, yeah. educational. Did any of that come from there? Or was, or was, where did it come from? Yeah. I think, uh, I think from several sources. I think part of it was just this profound sense of being working class and wanting to show that working class people had potential, they could do things in the world, and that they had grown up in these environments where they were marginalized and discounted. So when they had power, they wanted to say, look at that power you have from the shop floor, things you've learned, you know, you live in this community. Again, as Callaway would say, you're an economic being, but you're a social being, you're a psychological being. You have many other sides of yourself that you should have the opportunity to develop. I think believed in that, you know, that profoundly. And uh, I also think they felt that no matter how good your conditions were in the shop, you know, if you went out into an environment where conditions were not good, the infrastructure was bad, the schools weren't good, all this other stuff, how far had you really moved? So, I, I mean, I think in Callaway's case, I mean, he was one of these people that had read quite widely, I think. Uh, I think the other thing, Callaway, when he was in England, he was present at the, you know, when the uh, Labor Party took over the government and, you know, right after World War II from Winston Churchill. And so he saw the trade union movement playing a very significant role, not only in a shop floor environment, but socially. And also, I think the fight for racial justice was very much around the sense of being a total person, that both of them. And Gibbons just was, you know, um, he, he had been an Irish Catholic growing up in a largely Protestant community, and so he knew the sting of discrimination in that sense. And, I mean, he just was outspoken on this stuff. In some ways, actually, even more radical than Calloway when you get into the 1960s. Uh, so I think this sense, again, about racial justice and just race being the stain, the cancer in terms of the promise of America was there, and they really wanted to redeem that promise, and having workers as total persons was a part of that, because there were a group of people that were three-fifths. Oh, oh, Alice, Alice, uh, it's, it's, like I say, one of the things that took me a long time doing this, but it was a labor of love, was to read Callaway's journalism. Because he's just, his first article he writes in the National Urban League's publication, Opportunity, in 1935. Actually, his first article, which they rejected, was about marijuana use in rural areas. <laughs> yeah, gee, where's Ernest when they need him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and he writes about everything under the sun. I mean, he's just amazing. And, and the other thing is, I mean, he's a really skilled polemicist. You love him, Paul. I mean, his pen is truly dipped. I mean, when, he, and when he's going after opponents, man, I mean, you know, he, he ain't missing any words. So it was wonderful to read his journalism. And the Missouri Teamster in the 60s, if you read that, you know, a lot of union publications are pretty prosaic, right? You know, it's, I mean, here's, you won this grievance, you did this. I mean, they're writing cutting edge investigative pieces and commentary about urban politics, about welfare, the Vietnam War. I mean, it's a paper that crackles with energy and ideas. I mean, would that we had some more like that today. Anyway, yeah. Well, I was yeah. just gonna say the reason that I asked about that was because when, the, when labor took over in England, they were very powerful in the parliament with respect to saying the time has come to remove ourselves from being an empire in India. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And I just wondered yeah. if he noticed that and was affected by it. Well, he certainly, um, he didn't write so much about that, but I think he was certainly aware of uh, colonialism, you know, yeah. you know get, getting, getting uh, you know, scuttled. I think maybe part of his sense was he talked so much about the need to fight for racial justice. I'm, I'm sure I, would be, I would be pretty certain he was influenced if it's happening in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. in other you know, countries are getting away from the yoke of subjugation, that that has to happen in the United States as well. So yeah, I, I would imagine that was certainly you know, a piece of it. Uh, you know, also. But I think that was very formative for him being in England and watching that. And again, Gibbons really gave him the opportunity. Someone once, who I interviewed once said that, uh, or I read one, somebody was talking about Callaway was Gibbons' uh, house utopian. Because uh, he did a lot of different things. He was a research director, education director, organizing director, chief of staff. It was kind of like whatever Gibbons wanted him to do, both within the union and within the Central Conference of Teamsters, he did. But he apparently had an enormous amount of influence, uh, you know, within the union. It, yeah. it had to be some communist background somewhere, because it certainly was no. the Communist Party that tried to do integration and stuff. Yeah. It certainly was the Communist Party that, you know, did art training, you, all that kind of stuff. And it had to be there somewhere. 
Well, I got it. Well, actually, they were both fiercely anti-communist. Uh, Calloway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, they were certainly around the ferment of this period, no question. But um, if you think about um, uh, Gibbons's mentors among them are uh, Paul Douglas, who was a very f a famed liberal senator from uh, Illinois, and later was a socialist early in his career, and a woman named Lillian Herstein, who was one of the founders of the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, these were the people that schooled him, along with a woman named Danetta Diekman, who was a major figure in the YWCA when they were doing really interesting types of stuff. These were the people. It's very interesting. I, I didn't get into all the psychology of this, but Gibbons is very much nurtured by these strong, progressive-era women. And, he's, and they're still coming into his local in the 1960s doing reports for him and telling him about things he should do and chastising him because he's not putting enough women in positions of leadership. So well, he's... Mm, he knew him, but not a relationship. Callaway, I think, uh, you know, there are people in Chicago. He actually knows, for example, uh, Horace Caton and the authors of Black Metropolis, you know, that very famed study of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Those are people that he knows. Uh, he, they're, they're mostly around socialists. I mean, Callaway is briefly, if you want to go, we can dive deeper into the sectarian part. He's briefly a Lovestoneite. <laughs> yeah, Jay Lovestone, you know, is this pretty fairly uh, guy that ended up with all, all these CIA connections and everything, but he's expelled from the Communist Party for heretical positions by Stalin, you know, in the late 20s. But Callaway doesn't stay within that sectarian world very long. It's just that w at Brookwood, Earl Browder, who's the head of the Communist Party at the time, comes to speak, and at that time they're talking about a Negro belt in the South and self-determination for in a separatist African-American nation. And Browder's saying, you know, well, there's all this stuff about, he's talking about people speaking in Negro dialects and all this, and Callaway just goes ballistic. He goes, what is it? He says, everybody's kidding me. What's a Negro dialect? And so Callaway just totally rejects. He also just thinks that the communists really, in, in his view, often manipulated the issue of racial justice. I mean, he didn't deny their commitment totally, but for him, he often saw manipulation. And, and I'm, you know, I, and I would say, I mean, they did some stuff in terms of red baiting and all that is not particularly admirable, and I do refer to that in the book. But uh, they were not, they, they really were much more influenced by the Socialist Party. I mean, just to, just to say, although they're certainly in an era where all this other stuff is going on, there's no question of that. There's certainly a, a left milieu, shall we say, that they're, they're involved in. Yeah, Karen. This made me think. Well, and, and, and yeah, I'm not sure they yeah. weren't, you know, this isn't the Communist Party yeah. exactly, but those, uh, those leftist Marxist ideas, I think, they took like a better I don't think they ever, that's why I say I think they still thought in a socialist idiom or that, that they, they certainly knew the tune. Maybe the words were not the same, but they, the tune never left their, their heads. And again, you know, there were lots of anti-communist liberals in the labor movement who were down with the Vietnam War. I mean, Walter Ruther, who's the, you know, the leading sort of non-communist liberal, I mean, he's supporting the Vietnam War fairly late. He, he breaks much later. Gibbons and Callaway, you can read Callaway in the Missouri Teamster in 1965, denouncing American foreign policy and the CIA in terms that most communists would have, would have you know, raised their fists. So in foreign policy, they were, you know, very staunchly, I mean, you know, for want of a better term, on the left. They didn't become anti-communist liberals in terms of foreign policy. When President Johnson sends troops into the Dominican Republic, what was it, 1965, Callaway's, you know, writing against that. You know, so, yeah, so they're, so they're, you know, it's one of those deals, uh, they're, they're complicated uh, characters and, you know, oftentimes cross-cutting or there's ambiguity, there's all that stuff. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think I've chosen to do biographies is that uh, I, I kind of like living in that ambiguity. You know, it's just really, it's interesting how people aren't perfectly consistent and aren't consistently good and all those things. And, or is, uh, you know, uh, not a perfect man. Not, a, not perfect men by any means, but left their marks, I think, in some very important ways. Yeah, Peter. Is there any union now that you see as 
promoting this whole person you made. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's at least a 2-0 fastball, <laughs> maybe a 3. Uh, well, I would say this. Uh, I think SEIU probably comes closest, uh, although, again, it's interesting because SEIU is is controversial within the union movement in similar ways to the Teamsters, not about jurisdiction, but there is a broad sense that they tend to do stuff by themselves. You know, I mean, I hear this all the time, you know, just in my own world, maybe some of you do as well. But they di they've done these different community organizing things. It's just that the, the, the sobering part of this is that the, the roots weren't very deep and they didn't survive that long. I mean, I'm touting these things and I think they should be touted, but if the full story is told, five or six years is not a long time. These things are difficult to sustain. But SEIU has done some community efforts across the country, I think, that have some similarities to this. And I would say that they probably have the most potential <laughs> currently in the union movement to try to do something like this. The other thing I didn't mention is what another manifestation of this, and we see this in Seattle uh, with the teachers uh, union up there in Chicago. Uh, in LA, this notion of bargaining for the common good. You know, there's these ideas, particularly in the public sector, that you should put demands on the table that are not just about, you know, your union or, you know, wages, hours, and working conditions. But in Seattle, what was it? They wanted recess, a longer recess period for kids. In Chicago, it was the schools your, you, this, our students deserve. In Fix LA, they actually were saying we need more public employees back on the job because we lost them during the recession. And we want to examine the way the city invests, you know, the interest charges from banks that are ripping us off. And they actually got some commitments there through this Fix LA coalition. So I think there is, without trying to be too rose-colored about it, there is some of that potential out there. And I guess I would argue that given what's going on, why not? I mean, why shouldn't we try to do some experimentation? Because I think there's just rich potential there. Because I think most people do know that something's pretty radically wrong about our lives. I mean, just in terms of income and wealth inequality and deteriorating conditions. And the union movement, particularly the public sector, I think still has, well, uh, we'll see after the Friedrich's decision, but <laughs> they still have some resources left to do some of these things. I think teachers unions in particular are really beginning to pay more attention to this among others. So I, I think that there are some unions out there that are doing versions of this. Uh, and that's where I think the adaptation comes in because you know, the soil was different in 1950 and 60 than it is today. The plant can't just be taken, you know, willy-nilly and grow. But I think with some, the right, uh, I'll push the analogy a little further, with the right fertilizer, I think it could, it could work. Yeah. Yeah. Two questions. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. The Service Employees International Union. So they're, uh, well, a co kind of a cousin. They have a lot of public sector workers, home care and child care workers. They represent a lot of them. They have state employees in, in, in Oregon where I live. Uh, well, the state social service workers here. Okay. Hospitals, yeah, health, they have a huge health care division. Yeah, they're, what, they're, what, 1.8 million now or something? It's up to two. It's up to two, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, they've been a very, uh, you know, influential union, yeah. What's that? As you, as you talk, it reminds me of when we both worked with the steel workers at Penn State. And we had, they came for four weeks. First week was supposed to be you and your union. The second week was supposed to be you and your community. Yeah, The yeah. third week was yeah. supposed to be you and the in mm. politics. Yeah. The fourth week was supposed to be some kind of culture thing we were doing. Yeah, so, yeah. But what gets me is yeah. that as I'm listening to you talk, w we, we get that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, for one, yeah. didn't see it as an effort to make it be a, a, a kind of a whole person sort of a, yeah. a, a, of a program. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. I, you know, we, we, we did it kind of reflexively without yeah. thinking about it. Well, see, that's what I think to me what amazed me about these guys was just, and I, let me just say this, and I'm going to get to your second question real quick, but just to say that that they were so thoughtful. I mean, you just sit there and read how they thought about this. I mean, they really were sitting down and saying, here's the situation we're facing. What can we do strategically to address it? And, and that's why I, I say in the beginning, you know, I mean, Walter Ruther, and I take nothing away from him, was kind of the paragon of sort of, you know, liberal unionism in the post-war period. But I'd put them right up there on a smaller scale. I think what they were doing was as visionary and maybe even more thoughtful and deeper than some of the stuff that Ruther came up with. <laughs> So, you know, just to say, but you had a second question. Yeah. yeah. Why, did they, why did they not want the, the pharmacy unions to run the steel mills? Was it a power thing? Or? 
Well, the... Uh, Yeah, well, I think, that, but I think the terms that they wanted were ones that the farm workers, at least the, not the national Teamsters, wanted to absorb them, take their independence away, make them kind of a division of the union. And they were still very much a social movement, I think, and uh, one that, you know, really insisted. They wanted farm workers, as much as, you know, this, this idea that farm workers should shape their own destiny, and they were worried that they would be swallowed up by a union that really had a very different orientation from theirs, I think. Yeah, aspect, yeah, the, yeah. The that's where their roots were. Yeah. So there was a yeah. dispute. Yeah. Right. I mean, the farm, the people who picked the crop, and then the people who were canning. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. And that's how the Teamsters. You know, and the Teamsters, that was their thing when they were first growing. They were the fastest growing union in the country, even during the CIO, the Industrial Union years, because they would just take, you know, everything. I mean, once you got, you know, the cannery and you got the trucking and, you know, they had the power basically with all these industries that were related to each other, did they call it leapfrogging. If you could get this one, then you could leapfrog to this one, to this one, to this one. And it was this extraordinary organizing that they did. Peggy. Um, my perception when we, when we were talking about this total person union is in today's terms, we would call it holistic. You know, like I think that would mm -hmm. be a, a really mm -hmm. good way for them to, because it, it was such a renaissance. And that interest in so many things helped them to be so inclusive. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and like you were saying, it was kind of an intuitive thing. So if it is that, it must be just an intuitive. Yeah. But as a, as a union member, I teach at a Springport High School um, right up the road here. And um, I see a lot of pushback in our community. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand it. Like, even from my own, like, people that I hang out with, um, they are resentful of me. Because I have How could anybody be resentful of you? Because I have union benefits. And I <laughs> oh, 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 I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, all, yeah, like, yeah. And I keep saying, well, then why don't you get a union where you work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I keep yeah. trying to yeah. tell them. Yeah. You know, like, and yeah. I don't understand. What, yeah. What, and I have to say one other thing. This is what I was telling my friend. I was trying to get so many um, people to join me. The one thing that I saw that was so amazing with Bob is his ability to, um, to reduce conflict or mediate conflict. One time when we were at Penn State, this one um, business professor was trying to like nail him to the wall. <laughs> to the wall. <laughs> trying to get you to really, you know, just insightful. You know, he's trying to really insightful. And you, you just pulled him aside, put your arm around and said, uh, I don't think you're in a good place to talk. Why don't we go have a beer and talk? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's perfect. Well, that's well, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> Uh, I'm, sometimes I can pull that off. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if the yeah. students start to, you know, uh, I'll say, okay, here's not the time. Yeah. Let's just let's talk about this afterwards. Yeah, but you don't invite him out for a beer. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 No. Uh, you know, I, I think they, they wove together. I mean, a lot of things, I think, influenced them, you know, from the milieu of the time. I mean, I think even just going back to the mine workers and the communities where they were raised, I think that was really, really, you know, critical. And, uh, yeah, and, we'll, I cause that and Callaway wrote a lot about his, uh, his youth. I mean, it was interesting. He did a lot of autobiographical pieces that kind of helped pull those sorts of things together, which is why, I'd, you know, I'd, I'm, I would... I don't know, there's a part of me that wants to get away from this because I've worked on this for a long time and I can't even taste the soup anymore, but then there's another part of me that says, God, his writings would be interesting to do an edited thing on because they're just so unusual. How do, and, we get yeah. the, how do we get the concept out there other than somebody else buying your book? <laughs> oh, well, that's the only way to do it, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, 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 better marketing, but no, no. Uh, well, marketing no, no, no. Would help. Yeah, 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 no. But, but yeah. Peter, yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. Thinking, yeah. So there, there are plenty of folks now who are looking at Barton for the possibility. Yeah. And if I get started that kind of stuff, then there needs to be more of it. And nobody knows for sure, but that's what many of those acres of land are. Yeah. So I don't know how we move yeah. it forward. Yeah. That question. We're labor historians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. well, well, I mean, I mean, on my own small scale, I am, you know, kind of go out and talk about this. And I mean, and, and again, to me, it's just that, 
I think it's a story, as I said at the beginning, I think it, with, it does have relevance you know, for our times in terms of if it can be a discussion starter about some things we need to do or some of the efforts that are going on, on now and are an inspiration or inspire, you know, that, that's all to the good. I mean, I certainly, I would just say my own work as a labor educator, wherever we can, we try to support these types of activities and find forums and spaces to try to talk about them. And I think more and more, I would just say more and more of our work, it's not that we're neglecting teaching people how to bargain a contract or to process a grievance, but I think more of our effort has been around strategic planning, organizational change, and trying to think in larger structural terms, and also about broader alliances. Uh, you know, that's the one thing. I will say just, you know, I've been, I've been away from here for 14 years, but one of the things that I took a long time to happen in Oregon, but I'm really gratified to see it happening is that there's much more, I mean, Oregon is a very monocrit, well, it's a very white state, just put it that way. It's really, I mean, it just does not have much in the way of ethnic or racial diversity, but it's changing because actually through immigration in particular and refugee populations and all, and the union movement had been very, very slow to respond to that, and now it's really front and center. And I mean, still there's a gap between the faces on the executive board of the AFL-CIO and this new constituencies we're trying to reach. But in terms of working in actual alliances, more and more of that has happened. And to me, the most gratifying thing was there was a, something called this Fair Shot Coalition that had five demands it put before the legislature. And in addition to minimum wage and sick leave, ban the box you know, for people that have been you know, convicted of a crime and uh, ending racial profiling were on the table, and they weren't throwaways. People from the union movement fought for those just as hard as they fought for the quote unquote union or class issues, and it's really developing. So I think there's just some interesting potential in terms of those types of efforts, and you know, I, I, I think try to support those as much as we can. I mean, I think bargaining. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know that, that that's well, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Hey, Eli, bring out your pedal steel. <laughs> I'd get it out of the car. Important message, Bob. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, listen, I, I gosh, it's, it's 28. I thank you so much. It's just it's been del a delight. I really thank thank you all.